Good morning, everybody. Friday. It's a dim response for Friday, man. Friday usually gets like more love than that. Uh, Friday? Yay. <laughs> I'm disappointed on Friday's behalf. I feel good about Friday. Um, all right, so today we're going to continue on with, uh, with virtual memory, paging, swapping. We're talking about some things. So, um, so I've, I've, been I've been really enjoying the last couple classes. We've had really nice back and forth, which has been really good. Um, I mean, does anyone feel bored? Like we're going too slow or something? I'm, I'm actually asking this for you. OK, good. Because I'm, because I, you know, I, I, I write these slides and I, I have these grand ambitions that I'm going to cover like X amount of material and then we get through like 0.5x, which is fun, right? I'd rather do that and have you guys understand it. Um, what I think might happen, and, and I'm, I'll apologize for this in, in advance, is that I think that I was really hoping that I'd get through virtual memory before spring break. I don't think we're going to quite get there, right? Because there's some cool stuff that I do want to cover that I just don't think I'm going to be able to jam into the next lecture, and I want to do review on Wednesday. So I think. We'll have a little bit of virtual memory left when we get back from spring break. Hopefully, you guys won't have forgotten everything about this, uh, just most of it. Um, but so we will do a little bit when we get back. But that's just sort of how it works. So, so anyway, okay. So today we're gonna we're gonna go on. We're gonna talk a little bit more about swapping. We'll talk a little bit about exactly how swapping works. Uh, we'll talk about how to distinguish between page faults and uh, TLB faults. I'm going to mention briefly hardware managed TLBs because I think they're important to understand. And then finally, we're going to talk about what's called demand paging, right? Or, or a, a procrastinatory technique that the operating system uses in order to avoid doing more work than it has to, right? Not a kind of technique that I would recommend on any of your assignments in this class or in general in life, but on computer systems, it tends to work out pretty well. OK. So, so how many people here need a partner for the class? Raise your hand. OK. Keep your hand up. Everybody look around the room. Everyone has their hands up. Look around the room. There's, there's there are three of you guys, and you guys happen to be sitting all right by each other, right? So I think that's really convenient. Um, if you don't have a partner, at some point, I'm just going to put you in a group with somebody else, right? And depending on how lazy I'm feeling, I may do that completely randomly. Or I may try to include some other piece of data, right? I, I, don't, I don't know. It may, this may be just like a random scheduling algorithm. I might try to do some sort of priority-based whatever, right? But it really just depends on how much extra time I have. So but, but you, people that don't have a partner really need to get partnered up. Maybe there's people that are not in this room that didn't come to class that don't have a partner. Those people also need to have a partner. So today is, is my imposed deadline for getting you guys into groups. So the three of you guys, if you guys want to stay after class and sort of Fight it out among the three of you, right? One group will emerge, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and, and one of you will be sad and lonely. Uh, so that's just, that's just kind of unavoidable. But, um, but so the forums are, how many people have used the forum on the website? Does it work? Kind of? Is that a? OK, OK, OK. Any, anyway, I, it, I hope it works. I didn't write the code, clearly. But, um, so the forum's another place to look for partners. And again, at some point today or, or over the weekend, if you don't have a partner, you're, you're, there's just going to be some moment in time where some sort of script is going to run, and suddenly you're going to have a partner. Right? So if, if you prefer to find a partner that way, it's kind of fun. right? It's like the lottery. Um, that's cool. Otherwise, if you, if you want more of like a, a, a non-arranged marriage, then, uh, <laughs> then, then you know, use the forum or hang out after class or whatever and find somebody to work with. Okay? Questions about assignment two, partnering? Etc. All right. OK, so on Wednesday, we talked about store, how, how do we store page state, right? So we, have, we had this great idea of, of virtual memory as an abstraction, uh, of address space as an abstraction, giving the process an idea it has all this room. You know, virtual addresses gave us all this freedom and flexibility to do a lot of interesting things. But at some point, as, as we kind of worked our way into this, we came down to this issue of, now we have these 4K pages or 8K pages that are flying around the system. And there could potentially be a lot of them. And so you know, there were two issues that, that we kind of unearthed here. One was, how do we store the information that we need in order to manage these, right? specifically and in particular to load the TLB and to translate the virtual addresses when we need to? And the second problem was, how do we find that? Right? So how do we store it? And then how do we locate it rapidly? Right when when it needs to be located. Okay, 
So anyone have questions? Storing and retrieving page state. Wednesday. Seems like so long ago. Already. Wednesday. Any questions on this stuff? Okay, so let's start. My favorite people, way in the back of the room. So, so why do we need to store page state? What, what, what's, what's the point? We need to keep what up to date? As, as the system is running, you know, I, I need to keep information about pages for what purpose? What's, what's the real thing that I'm doing with this information, primarily? Um, virtual address mapping. Mapping, and, and, how, and what piece of hardware helps me do that mapping? The MMU and what specific, okay, th th we're getting closer. I heard TLB right here, right. So, so really what I'm doing is I'm just keeping the TLB up to date, right? The TLB or the MMU is going to ask me, I don't understand how to translate this virtual address, and I need to be able to tell it this is the physical address that this virtual address points to, right? Or this is the memory-like thing that this virtual address points to, okay? Morning. So the first thing I need to do is I need to store information about each virtual page. And then what's the second thing I need to do, Jason? Couldn't tell me. I just gave you the answer like two seconds ago. Want to make a guess? I need to store it, and then I need to be able to what? Retrieve. Access it, locate it, retrieve it, and, and do that fast, OK? Because again, as soon as I'm in the kernel looking up a virtual address translation, something has already gone wrong, right? What is the thing that went wrong over here? If I'm in the kernel trying to translate a virtual address, what bad thing has already happened? The TLB didn't know how to translate it already, right? I want the TLB to do all my translation. It's super, super fast, right? If the TLB and the MMU can translate pages, I'm in heaven, right? When I get into the operating system, I'm already slow. And if it takes a long time to locate the information about the page, I'm just getting slower and slower, right? OK. What information? So what does the operating system need to know about each virtual page? OK, so I've got a virtual address. It falls into some virtual page. What information do I need to store about that page? Dr. One thing, one thing. The uh, head of an address? Yeah, I need to know where it is, right? The location. And, and the location, as we started to talk about at the end of, my, uh, end of last class, right? It could be in memory, right? There might be memory holding the contents of this virtual page. It could be on disk, right? And we'll talk, we're going to talk today more about swapping, which is the process of moving things out of memory onto disk in order to create, a, create space in memory for new things. And then there's one other final option here, which is that the process may have never used this page before, right? And we'll talk a little bit about this today as well, meaning that the page is about to come into being, right? So, so when the process first uses the page, I'm going to give it a brand new page, right? So the page may be uninitialized. That's another option, OK? What other information might I want to know about the page and need to store? Permissions, right? What's the process allowed to do to data on this page? Is it allowed to execute instructions from this virtual page? Is it allowed to read or write to this virtual page? Right? What else? Statistics. I'm hearing it whispered from like this group, right? Maybe it's all three of you together. Statistics, right? Has this page been read or written from recently and how many times? And this will become more and more important today and then also on Monday, right? Because on Monday, we're going to start to talk about policy, right? Policy about how, how and when to move pages back and forth to disk in order to create the illusion that there's more memory. And in order to do this well, we need some information about the pattern of page accesses, right? Or I shouldn't say we need it, but it makes things much, much nicer, right? If we know something about which pages are being used heavily, we can do a better job of moving things back and forth to disk. Rob? You made a noise. I thought you were going to. No, I was just laughing. Oh, OK, laughing. Oh, wow. Okay. Hope it wasn't at me. No. <laughs> that's, not, that's an unconvincing no. <laughs> All right. So, and, and then what was our requirement for how we store this information, right? What, what's, what's, what's the thing we're trying to do here? Okay. Compactness. There we go. He's following up his, 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 his giggling with an answer, right? Because the number of page table entries, right? We call this thing that we use to store the page state of page table entries. How many of these am I going to have, roughly? I need one for every what? What's that? Borg head? Never mind. No, I, I didn't, didn't know what you were saying. But I, he I heard various things. Virtual page. So any virtual page allocated by any process on the system. 
I have to store this information. And remember, our address space abstraction is designed to encourage processes to use lots of memory. You've got two gigabytes or three gigabytes or four gigabytes of address space. Use it. Yeah? Do we have uh, such stacks for TLD also? Because we need some policy It really depends, right? So a lot of the statistics collection, right? So, so let me ask this question, right? So assuming that, that, that good things are happening, and the operating system is not involved in the translation of a particular page, how do I collect statistics? Right? How would I collect statistics about a page? What would I have to rely on to help me? What's that? Well, what would that mean? What, let's say I try to collect statistics by using the kernel. What does that mean I have to do when the page is accessed? I have to trap it in the kernel. And that's the exact thing I was trying not to do, right? because it's slow. So what do I need to rely on here to help me out, usually, when I'm doing hardware? right? Because in the best case, when the translation is, is being when used in the TLB, or today we'll talk about cases where the memory management unit can actually load the address into the TLB without trapping into the operating system. In those cases, hardware is the only thing that sees what happened. Right? The operating system is trying, well, I'm trying to stay out of the way as much as possible. Right? So collecting really, really fine-grained statistics about page use is difficult. Right? And it's difficult because normally I don't want to do that on every page access. Right? So there's a balance here, and we'll come back to this on Monday, right? between making page translation and page accesses as fast as possible and being able to save some information about how often the page has been accessed. Right? If I was really trying to save every, if I was really trying to count and record every time a page was read and written to, I would argue that in most cases that's not feasible. Right? That requires too much work, even by hardware on what has to be a very, very, very efficient operation of, of translation. Right. All right. It's a great question, though. And, and we will, we'll talk about this more on Monday. All right. So what do we call, well, shoot, I gave it away again. What do we call the single entry storing information about a single virtual page? Page table entry, the name of the slide. Oh, man. I, I outsmart myself all the time. All right. So oh, I did it again. Man, OK. What, so what do I use a page table? It's clearly called a page table, right? What do I use a page table to do? I'm going to use it to map a what to a what. So it's a virtual address, but what, what specifically is it? I'm using pages, so it's a virtual what? Page number, right? So the virtual page number for a process, and god, I keep forgetting to do this. I map a process and a virtual page number, and then what do I want to find? A page table entry, right? Some information about the process about the page. Now, the, it's not necessarily, the page table will not necessarily map a virtual address to a physical address, because the page may not be in memory. Right? But the point is, the operating system, the TLB tells the operating system, I don't know what to do about this virtual address that was used by this process. And the operating system needs to be able to very, very quickly retrieve information about that page. Right? Could be on disk, could be in memory, could not be initialized yet, whatever. Right? OK, we call these page tables. Right? And I just gave away the answer to this, too. Processes have separate page tables. Why? Because virtual addresses are, are private. Right? Virtual addresses don't make any sense outside of the context of a process. Right? All right. So we, we talked about three different designs of page tables. Right? I had flat page tables. I proposed a linked list page table design. And then I had this uh, somewhat more mature tree-based multi-level page table. Right? So flat page tables, what, what was the access cost here? A one, right? One lookup. The virtual page number is used directly as an index into the flat page table. What about the size? Large, big, too big. You know, one big fat array, right? Very, very terrible. And, and, and an array that is sparsely used, right? Again, what we've seen over and over again is that Big contiguous data structures are a bad fit for our address space abstraction. Right? Address spaces are huge and sparsely used. Right? So, so big contiguous data structures generally don't work well. All right? What about the linked list page table? What's the speed, lookup speed? Assuming I have n virtual pages. O of n, right? I have to potentially walk the entire list. Right? Maybe I sort it. I'd do a little better than this, whatever. Right? But the point is generally O of n. What about size? O of n, right? And, and the nice thing about it is that 
every, you know, it's, it's, as, it's as small as it can possibly be, right? There's no entries that are unused. Every entry is in there because it's, it's an entry that's valid, okay? Multi-level page table, speed of access. How many accesses does it take, potentially? OC, right? Like some constant number of accesses, right? You know, depending on the depth. You know, if I have a two-level, multi-level page table, then I have two accesses. If I have a three-level, I have three, three indexes I need to look at, right? All right, size. Varies, because, but in general, larger than a linked list, smaller than a flat array, right? And, and this is... This is a design that operating systems have chosen, many operating systems have chosen, simply because it provides a nice balance between the size of the data structures that I need to hold this information and the speed of access. Right? Remember, speed is important here. But if I store, use too much memory to store all this information, there's not enough left for the process, or any left for the process at all. Right? All right, after our little review, any other questions? Storing and retrieving page state. Questions? Any questions about all makes perfect sense. Everybody's going to get all of these questions right next week on the midterm. It's awesome. OK. All right, so, so, we, so we talked, and we've sort of been hinting at this, right? And now the time has come to finally sort of fully pull back the covers and, and admit that virtual addresses don't always map to physical memory addresses, right? Sometimes my, what I want to do is I want to utilize, I want to exploit this, this nice property of the virtual addresses that they require translation to play games behind the processes back, right? And the normal game that I want to play is if I need more memory, I want to move things out of memory, right? I need to preserve the contents, right? But I want to move things out of memory, and the typical place that I move things out of memory is I move them onto the disk, right? And there's, but there's no real limitation here, right? I mean, you could write a system that swapped to the network, assuming that you could do it reliably. You could write a system that swapped onto a tape backup drive, right? That would be really slow and terrible, right? But, but the point is, you just, th there's some, you know, slower, larger backing store, as we sometimes call it, that is used to preserve the contents of a page that was in memory during a period of time when the page was not used and until the page is accessed again. And we'll talk, we're going to go through today in detail both cases, right? When do, when do we move a page out? What do we have to do? And when do we move it back in, OK? And again, when I do swapping well, your system, that the idea of, of any, that when, you're, when you place a cache in front of something, the idea is you want the thing to look as big as the big thing, but look as fast as the small thing. And this is no exception, right? And when this is done well, that is how your system looks, right? Especially when it's done well, an operating system can hide the slowness of the disk, right? And we're going to talk a little bit today and on Monday about ways that the operating system tries to hide the slowness of the disk, right? Particularly by moving some of that slowness off of critical interactive paths, right? So if your operating system does something slow while you're not waiting, you don't notice. But if your operating system does something while slow while you're waiting, you notice, right? And so one of the tricks here is to move some of the slow pieces off of interactive paths. Right? So don't do them while somebody's waiting. Right? And again, that what, what can happen here, though, is if, I, I don't know, there's not really a good analogy here, but this is kind of like being underwater in your house or something, right? I mean, on some level, if things go wrong and the operating system plans badly, then what can happen is that the memory can look as slow as the disk. Right? and feel as small as the memory that you have. Right? So this is, these are the two bounds here. Right? There's no way it can look any slower than the disk, and there's no way it can potentially look any smaller than the memory, and so, unless I start artificially limiting memory for some reason. And in, in the, so these are the extremes, right? and we want to be here. Right? We, we don't want to get down here, but this can happen. Okay? Questions about swapping, about this idea in general? I think this, is, I think this kind of makes some degree of sense by this point, I'm hoping. All right, so. Let's say, and again, bear with me for a minute, that I've decided to move a page to disk, right? Why, why would I do this? First of all, why, why would I be moving a page out to disk? Usually to make room for something else, right? I've run out of memory, and a process needs a page. It's, 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 accessed, it's attempted to access a page. And so I need to move something out, right? OK? What do I need to do? What are, what are the steps here? So I've got a page in memory, and I want to write that page out to disk, right? So what do, what do I need to do in order to ensure that this happens safely? 
What's the first thing I need to do? Anybody? What's that? Let's, okay, so yeah, let, let, let's say I have that page. I have a page, I've chosen my page, I've got a page in memory, and I want to swap it out to disk, right? Gotcha. Maybe like close it and lock it so nobody's going to use it while you're swapping? So, uh, so the, your idea is perfect, but how do I accomplish this? How do I make sure that a process can't keep using the page while I'm, I'm swapping it out? Invalidate then, Invalidate it where, specifically? Uh, for the process. For the process, but where? In the TLB, right? If the translation is in the TLB, then the process can keep using it without me even noticing, right? And in particular, on multiprocessor systems, one, process, you know, one core might be trying to swap the page out, but the process that's using the page might be running on the other core, right? And so this can happen, right? But the first thing I have to do is I have to get that entry out of the TLB, right? If it's in there. Because if it's in the TLB, it's possible that the process can keep using it with, without me having anything to do with it, right? And, and what might happen is that I might start copying some of the data and the process might change the page and I might not notice that and when I finish copying the data, the data that's on the page and the data that's in memory don't match anymore, right? So, so when I, go, I have a diagram here, we go through that, I'll, I'll point out when that can happen, okay? So get the entry out of the TLB, yeah? How do you check if it's in use or not? What do you mean? Right, right, but, but remember, when I, so, so, uh, so on the processor that's doing this, right, I'm assuming, so on a single core system, no one else can be using it because I'm running, right, and I'm not using it. On a multi-core system, what do I have to do? What was the thing we talked about last time that had kind of a cool name? What's that? TLB shoot down, right? So I need to, I, I, have, I, have, I have Nerf guns now. Uh, is it my, one of my colleagues brought something. I thought about bringing one to class, but I thought that would be weird. Uh, but maybe, maybe next week. Um, maybe for midterm preparation. Anyway, so it's basically, you know, like I need to, you know, there's a TLB entry on another process and I need to kind of like shoot it down, right? I mean, I need to invalidate it. And, and, and you're, you're right, someone else could be using it, right? And, and on some level, that would probably be a bad thing. Why would, it, why would that be a kind of a terrible thing if somebody was using it right at that moment? Well, but let's say I can stop it safely. Right? Let's say that I shoot down the entry in the other TOB, and then a second later, somebody tries to translate the page. What's the problem here? Because you're using, and you just save the state, and I'm in the process of moving the page to disk, right? I've chosen this page to move to disk, and now someone else is going to try to access it right away. Well, what does that mean? I've got to put it back, you know? So what, if, if, the, if the page is being used right as I'm trying to swap it out, this usually means that I, to I picked a terrible page to swap out, right? I mean, if literally somebody is using it right in that moment, you know, that's the worst possible case, right? Because usually what I'm going to have to do is ma maybe I can abandon my swap out and leave it and choose a new page. But in the worst case, it gets, I get all the way through here, and then somebody access it. And then it's like, OK, you know, now I've got to kick out some other page. Right? And what have I done? Right? I've slowed down two processes, right? the one that's waiting for me to do this and the other process that now has to stall waiting for the page to come back in. I've done two disk IOs and memory is the same as it was before. Right? So this is like a total fail. Okay? Not, not good at all. Right? But anyway, but I need to make sure that I do this just in case right? because I, can't, I need to make sure the other process can't translate this address while I'm swapping. Okay? So now I've, I've, I've removed the address from all the TLBs. What's the next thing I need to do? This is, this is a pretty simple process. I think there's only three steps. What's that? Well, of the table, I need the same substate, but it's not the table. What's that? Why? Well, I, I, no, no, no. That's not, not quite right. What, what's the next thing I need to do? Copy the page to disk, right? I've got data in that page, right? In order to play this game, I've got to have that data be preserved, right? So I've got to copy the, da the data to disk, right? So I've got a 4K spot on disk that I've chosen to put this data, and I just start a disk I.O. to copy all the data from memory onto <coughs> that, into that part of the disk, OK? And now, what's my third step? Change the page table entry, right? The page tables are my source of information about what is happening. 
right? Now, now, this is a logical description. When you guys implement this for assignment three, you might need to do portions of this kind of all at once, right? Because again, if there's a, there's a TLB fault for this page address right here, I need to know that the page is in the process of being written to disk. So sometimes I need to store more information in the page table than just where the page is. But Isaac, you had a doubt or a question. Yeah, no, I have a question. Um, some systems for example, require to format the disk when you're going through, like a partition would be a swap file What's the difference between a swap file system and uh, any other raw partition? Because uh, it's writing raw data, so why do you have to format? I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure there is a big difference, right? I mean, you know, maybe it's like a, a multiple, the, the blocks or sizes of 4K, I don't know, right? But 4K is normally, so, so that, but that's actually, well, well, we'll come back to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go there. We'll come back to this when we talk about file systems a little bit, right? There's a reason that I don't want to write this to a normal file, right? As Isaac said, normally what an operating system does is it uses a part of the disk in, in essentially, so remember we talked about the file abstraction and how that file abstraction maps it down to disk blocks? For swapping, I normally just use the disk blocks directly, right? Because I don't have variable size files. Every file, quote unquote, in my swap file system is the same size. They're all 4K, and so I don't need these extra features. I don't need open close. I don't need to read and write arbitrary number of bytes. I'm always writing 4K, 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 right? And so I can use this. And, and for assignment three, you guys will do this. You'll create a raw disk device on OS 161, and you'll use that as your swap device, right? I hope not. And I, eh, I, yeah, I, I, don't know any, I don't know much about Windows, right? but I can look at that. I, I would be surprised. Right? You just don't want all that file system machinery here. It just slows you down. Right? Uh, yeah, Robert. When you install an operating system, yep. um, that operating system has a knowledge that it's going to do those operations. Yep. So and then time, what do you unreadable Oh yeah, no, no, no. I mean, how many people have ever installed Linux? When you install Linux, it creates a swap, a, a swap partition, and if you do mount or whatever, you can normally see what that swap partition is, right? So yeah, when you install Linux, it, it allocates a portion of the disk for swap, right? And that is, is that is accessed, like I said, in a special way. There's no file system on top of it. It's used directly as disk. Right? All right, so this is it. Let's, but let's, let's walk. Oh, yikes, yikes. Everything's moving around. It just takes a minute. You know, my complicated diagram. Uh, Firefox has to think. OK, so here, here, here's, our, here's our world, right? I've got an address space. I've got physical memory. I have something in the TLB, right? And let's say that the process is using some code page, right? The TLB has loaded a mapping for that. And there's some physical page on, in memory that's been allocated for that code page, right? In addition, the kernel has a page table entry, which has other pieces of state in it. I didn't want to make this like too ferociously complicated, right? But one of the things it definitely has is it has the location of where that page is, right? Where is that virtual page? And it points into memory because that's where the virtual page is, right? So, you know, lightning review, what do I need to do to swap this page out? So the, the first time it was this side of the room, I'm going to go to this side this time. So the first, first thing I need to do. I need to remove the TLB entry, right? I got to get this thing out of there, right? Because if I don't, the process could potentially continue to use it, right? Maybe on another core. All right? What's the next thing I need to do? Copy. Got to copy the, the data, right? So I've got blah, blah, blah in my memory, right? Blah, 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 right? <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. Man, you guys are cheap laughs sometimes. <laughs> but I'm glad, I, I'm glad I did this this way. I thought about it last night. It was late. I was like, do I really want to add three more slides? To go blah, blah, blah. And I'm glad I did. Um, but, but actually, the other reason I'm glad I did is because so, so this, this illustrates the problem that we face when it comes to getting that entry out of the TLB, right? Because if I didn't do that, what could happen, right? So remember, disk is slow. So this process right here takes a long time. Right? In, in operating system speed, in instruction speed, right? in memory speed. This is slow. Okay? If I had left the entry in the TLB and the process continued to use this page, right? I started writing blah, blah, and I'm going to finish writing blah, blah, blah. This is going to be great on the video. Right? 
So the process might overwrite the first blah. It might write like foo blah blah, right? And, and, but I've already written that byte, and so I have blah, and I, this isn't on the slide, and I have blah 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 on disk, and in, in memory I have foo blah blah, right? And why is this a problem? What's the next thing I'm going to do with this piece of memory? I'm going to replace it, probably going to, and normally when I, when I exchange memory between processes, I zero it first, right? So I'm going to clean it off, right? This is actually, this is a great question. It's not covered in here. Why, when I exchange pages between a pr two different processes, do I generally fill the page with zeros? Why would I do that? Why not just hand, it, it seems like it's a little, it's going to slow me down. Why not just hand the page to a new process, Tachi? Because then you're leaving some information from Exactly. Right? I'm leaking information between processes. Right? If, I take a, if I take this page, you know, there might be another malicious process over here that's like, what is that cool process doing? Right? What is it going on about? Right? And if I give it this page that says blah, blah, blah on it, well, it's going to know. Right? So, so in general, it, it's, a, it's a security issue. Right? I don't give, and it also helps with some other things, but when I give Either a process, a new page, even if it came from that own process, I always zero it out, right? I give you a nice, clean page of memory to start. Why don't we move it over to copy? Or we don't have zero information? I mean, this is a move, right? Like, on some level, moving something to disk, if it's in memory, requires doing the copy and then deleting it, right? So that this, is, this is like a move broken down into its individual pieces, right? So yeah, that's basically what it is, okay? All right, so I write this, and now what's the third thing I have to do? Over here, this side of the room. Update the page table entry, right? Because next time I try to translate this virtual address, I'm going to find this PTE, and the PTE better tell me something about where that page is, because I'm going to have to go get the contents, right? And put them back in memory before I, give, I can restart the instruction and give the process the illusion that the thing has been in memory the whole time, right? All right. Good. So let's think about the parts of this that are slow and the parts that are fast. Right? Three steps. First step, removing something from the TOB. Slow or fast? Fast, very fast. Boom, done. Hardware. TOB shoot down might be a little bit slower, right? Because I have to interrupt all the other processors, but in general, this is fast. Copying the contents of the page to disk. Slow, really, really slow, right? Update the page table entry to indicate that the page is on disk. Fast, right? Now let me ask you something else. Why do I care? Why do I care about swapping out being slow, right? Or let's put it this way. Remember I said before, I care about doing things that are slow when somebody's waiting, right? So I'm sw if I'm swapping out a page, who's waiting for the page to be swapped out? Another process that's what? Wanting some more memory, right? So the reason that I'm swapping out, the, the, the reason I would be swapping out on, on uh, I'm trying to think of it, like the reason I would be forced to swap out memory uh, synchronously is that another process has tried to allocate some memory. Maybe it called fork. Maybe it called sbrate to get more heap. Maybe it just started using some code pages that I hadn't brought in for memory yet. We'll talk about that later in the class, right? So in general, this, this, this is a, this is a, if I'm doing this on a synchronous path, meaning somebody is waiting, it's because they're waiting for the memory that I'm about to free up by swapping out, right? So I care about making this fast. So, okay, the second step here is slow, right? Copy the contents of the page to disk. That's really slow, okay? Does anyone want to speculate about how I can make this faster? What could I do? What, so, so I could have, what, what, what does that mean? I like I like the idea. You guys are you guys are getting out to some good OS principles. But how do how do I apply an idea from a cache here? Oop. Let me see if this. Has, yep. Anybody else want to make a guess? Ah ah. Change since when? Right. So there's two things here, right? So like I said, this can be on a, on a critical path. This can be on a synchronous path. This can be slowing somebody else down, so I want to make it fast, right? And what I can do is essentially what, what you suggested. But, but, there's, but there's an even a better wrinkle to it, right? 
So normally when I start allocating pages, the system will actually have a dedicated place in, on the swap disk reserved for that page. Right? This is kind of important because it means that every time I'm swapping out, I'm swapping out to the same spot. Right? Now what I do is that when the system is idle, when there's nothing else interesting happening, like maybe when you walked away for coffee or when you're, uh, you've, you've let your laptop go idle because you're paying attention to this fantastic lecture, um, that the operating system will be trickling data from memory onto the swap disk. Right? So it'll take pages from memory. It doesn't swap them out, but it copies the contents. And what does this mean? It means that I have, hopefully, when it comes time to swap out a page or when it comes time to allocate memory, I have a group of pages that I call clean. And what clean pages are are pages where the contents on the swap disk match the contents that are in memory. Right? And what does this mean when I go to swap the page out? What can I avoid doing? What's that? Discard swapping clean pages. I can just throw it out, right? So, so if I have a page that doesn't map its swap disk content, it's called dirty, right? And now here, instead of always copying the contents of the page to disk, I can only copy them if the page is dirty, right? If the page is clean, it means I already have the contents of it cached, you might think of it, right? In this case, I'm using a slow thing to cache, right? I'm using the disk to cache the contents. And the idea is, but essentially, uh, there, there's, a, there's an aspect of this that's kind of, uh, you know, this is anti-procrastination, right? This is, prepare, this is preparation, right? The system knows that at some point you might launch a new process, right? So your, your thing's been sitting idle for five minutes. You're going to come back and you're going to start a Photoshop, right? So rather than sitting around on its butt doing nothing, right, while you're gone, the operating system is like, you know what, I'm going to prepare, you know? I'm going to prepare for the worst. May, you know, I'm going to get ready so that if suddenly there's this massive request for new pages, I could just start tossing stuff, right? And I know it's in the swap. Okay? Does this make sense? This is kind of a, this is kind of a neat idea. Now, what is, what is your name? Nitin. So, so you brought up something else, which is really interesting, right? So he said, if the contents of the page haven't changed since it was brought into memory, so what, what type of pages have contents that in general almost never change? Code. So this is another, and I didn't have it information up on the slide, but it's a great point, right? So code pages that are used by a process generally don't change, right? And they're usually marked as read only because people stopped writing self-modifying code in the 80s, right? Because it's really bizarre and hard to do. So in general, the contents of code pages don't change, which means the code pages on some level are great because I can always just throw them out. Now, where, can I, where do I find that code page? Right? So I could just, the first time I load the code page, copy it to swap, but where does the code page come from? It came from a file on disk. It, in fact, it came from a file on disk in the ELF format. Right? That's how I loaded it during exec. And so, I mean, the, the, you get, the, there gets to be some subtlety here because executables can change. Right? But in general, I could attempt an even further optimization. I might say, I don't even have to allocate swap for code pages. Right? Because when I need to reload a code page, I just reload it from the ELF file that it came from in the first place. Right? So this, is, this can be kind of a clever optimization. I don't know actually how this works out in real systems. Because the point is, if I change, you know, let's say I change bash. Right? I install a new version of bash, and I have 10 copies running. Right? I actually don't know what happens in that case. Right? Because I'm changing the code. And so what could happen is that you know, if I'm relying on the, the executables being on disk, and now I've changed it, I might get you know, a, a weird, bizarre hash of different parts from different, two different executables. So I, I'd have to look into this and see how this works. But it's possible here that, especially for code pages, I can do some additional things because they're never changed. Right? All right. So let's talk about swapping stuff into memory. All right? Stuff coming in. Right? So we have to swap a page in when the virtual address is used. Right? And, and at some level, this is a part of what's something called on-demand paging, which we'll either get to later today or tomorrow or Monday, right? But, but on some level, the thing, the thing to consider here is that unless I'm doing something clever, whenever I swap in a page, it means that the process is waiting for that page to be there, right? The process has tried to translate the address. And again, I've told it, oh, that's a memory address. 
yeah, trust me, that's a memory address, you know? And then it tries to use it, and I'm like, oh crap, it's on disk, right? I've got to you know, run, go get it, put it in there. You know, so, so this, is, this is in general kind of a, a very important path to get to be fast, right? Because there's a process waiting, right? So what do we need to do? So I'll help you out. First thing, the process executing an instruction that tries to use that address. The first thing I better do is stop that instruction, right? Because that address is not valid. And so, what, so we, this goes back maybe a month, right? So I know it's ancient history. So remember, there were three ways that we, that we entered the kernel, right? Does anyone remember what those three ways are? It's this good midterm review. System calls or software interrupts. Hardware interrupts and what? Exceptions. And when we talked about exceptions, we kept coming up with our favorite, which was divide by zero, right? Which is an exception that might call me to kill the process. But trying to translate an address that's not in the TLB also creates an exception, right? And this is how the operating system gets control, right? So if the address isn't in the TLB, I have a TLB miss exception, and the operating system will start to run, right? And essentially what, what, it, what has happened already, what the processor did for me, is it stopped that instruction, right? Rather than executing that instruction, because it can't, it raised an exception, all right? What's the next thing I need to do? Let's say this page is on disk, right? I'm swapping in, it's coming in from disk. What's the next thing I need to do? I better find the page, right? Well, OK, there's, so, so I, I, there, there's two ways to do this, right? Uh, and some of these don't have to be done in this order, right? I need somewhere to put the contents, right? So I'm going to bring in a page from swap, and so I need to find a page in memory that I can use. If the system is really, really um, he heavily loaded, and most of the memory is in use, what might this require? Swapping out some other page, right? So this can get even slower, right? So a swap in can actually trigger a swap out, right? OK? But let's say I have a page lying around that, that, that maybe, maybe I've already written the contents to disk, so the swap, in is very, a swap out is very fast. Maybe I've trimmed some memory over time. A lot, of times processes, a lot of times systems will actually try to maintain a certain amount of free memory at all times, right? So rather than just waiting until they need memory, they'll be constantly sort of, it's like, it's like having your hair cut, you know? It's like constantly trimming off little bits to try to keep it ever from getting too long, right? Rather than waiting until it gets long and then cutting a foot off. You know, they're constantly, trying, oh, you do, I don't think you need that page. I'm going to put that a page on, I don't think you need that page. So they're constantly trying to have some sort of reserve around. Because frequently, when a new process starts, there's this barrage of new pages that have to be brought in, right? So if, if, if page allocation were like this slow, gradual process, you might not need to do this. But, what, what, but, but the thing that causes big booms in page allocation is like you start Microsoft Word, right? And suddenly, like, 10,000 new pages need to be located, right? Or whatever. It actually might be that much. Um, OK. So and then, and as, as Michael said, now I've got to find the page. Right, so now, now I need my page table entry to be correct. So I've got to find that page on disk. That page is somewhere on disk, it better be, right? Um, if, if it's a page that the process has used before that's got some data on, I wrote that data to disk, so I need to find the data. What's the next thing I need to do? Copy it back, right? So I've got to copy it into memory, okay? And then what's the, I think there's seven here. What's the fifth thing? Update the page table entry, right? Because now the page is in memory. What's the sixth thing? What's the last piece, of st last piece of system that needs to find out about this? The TLB, right? Got to tell the TLB, here's the new translation. And then finally, what do I do? What did, what did I do? What's the first thing I did? Restart. Now I've got to restart the instruction. Sorry, I know we're getting to the, sort of the basement of the slide here, right? So now I've got to restart the instruction that was, that was trying to address that virtual address, right? Because now it's memory again, right? Again, the, here's the illusion, right? The illusion is that the addresses are always memory, right? But because the illusion wasn't true when the address started to execute, sorry, the instruction started to execute, I had to take some time to, re to recover that illusion. And now the address is in memory and it, and it will act like memory, right? OK, so let's go through our example. So I have this page on disk, right? The page table entry is correct. The TLB doesn't have an entry for it. Great, OK? So what's the first thing that happens that in, in, in our example that triggered this, this swap in? Well, I executed an instruction, right? The process said, oh, I want to load OX10, and that's the virtual page number, and I didn't bother with an offset, right? So I want to load some address on page 10, right? And that creates an exception, right, which stops that instruction from executing. What's the next thing I need to do? 
over here. You need to allocate a page, right? Well, I, uh oh, uh oh, this doesn't match the slide. Okay, no, it does, right? <laughs> uh, okay, allocate a page. Although sometimes, for some reason, that's three, right? Okay, so I need to allocate a page, right? And I, I think this was supposed to to refer to find the page on disk, right? So on some level, I have to do both these things, right? I need to figure out where the data is and find somewhere to put it, right? Okay, after I've done this, I know where the data is. I know where to put it. What do I do now? Copy it in. And this, again, is a slow process, right? Now it's updated. Now what do I do? I've got to move the PTE, right? Making sure that the next time, maybe if, it, it, maybe if this entry falls out of the TLB, I'm going to need to reload it. So the page table entry needs to point to where it is in physical memory, right? All right, the sixth thing is what? Update the TLB, right? And, and you'll see here that and if you remember the last example, it, it pointed to physical page number 50, and I've changed it, right? Because that's what happened, right? This page is not, is, is rarely, if ever, going to come back into the same physical page location that it was before. What matters is that the virtual page number is the same, right? Because the process doesn't know anything about physical memory, okay? And finally, what's the last thing I do? Let that instruction go, baby. Let it go. Let it roam free. Okay. So, so again, so, so how this whole process works is extremely dependent on how we choose the pages to write out to disk, right? As you mentioned before, if I choose a page to write out that's in the process of being actively used, I'm in trouble, right? This is bad, you know? Um, and, if, and ideally, I choose a page to swap out that will never be used again, right? The process will go to his grave never having touched that page again, right? That is the ideal scenario. And if I can't get that, then I want the process to go for as long as possible without touching that page. Right? Because there's a cost. There's a fixed cost to moving stuff back and forth to disk. I have to do several IOs, which takes time. And I have to, it's really, it's, 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 the cost is, is, is in two components. One is the time it takes. Right? The other is the disk IO that's necessary. Right? And the longer I can use the memory that I freed up, by swapping a page out to disk before I have to bring that page back in, the more I amortize the cost of doing those operations. Right? So, so that's my goal. Okay? So let me just introduce you to the idea of on-demand paging before we finish today, and then, and then we'll come back to this on Monday. Okay? So, so sometimes, rarely, procrastination is a useful thing. Right? And, and the best things to procrastinate about are the ones that if you wait long enough, you may never have to do, right? So never do something immediately if you might never have to do it at all, right? And sometimes if you wait long enough, the person who's asked you to do it will give up and ask somebody else, right? That, that's not, that, that analogy doesn't quite get here. But I am not going to give up and stop asking you to do your assignments, right? So don't try it in this class, right? But, but in general, in life, this can't this can work, right? So, so let's think about how this works. So the process is of the kernel. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm Microsoft Word or I'm OpenOffice. I don't want to pick on Word. OpenOffice is really slow too, okay? So I'm OpenOffice or I'm whatever, and I've got this huge chunk of code. And I'm, and I'm, running, I'm running exec, and the process, the ELF file is saying, here is this like big chunk of code. Put it into my address space, right? So what, what could the kernel do? Let's say the kernel was like this right on the ball, you know, go-getter sort of kernel. What, what, what would it do? It would take this huge chunk of code, all of it, and it would find somewhere in memory to put it. Right? It would be like, OK, you've got you know, a gigabyte worth of code. That's cool. You must be a really cool program. You know? I'm going like, to sit here blasting away at the disk for like two minutes looking for memory for you so that you can load this huge blob of code. Right? Now, let's say that I have a kernel that's a little more, you know, again, just kind of like, OK, you know, I, I'm on top of things, but. I'm not going to necessarily get to everything right away. What might it say? Right? It might say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a note of that. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down what you asked me to do. I'm going to write down this virtual address region that you asked me to use. And I'm going to make a note of where that code is, just in case I need to get to But I'm not going to load it right now. Right? And why wouldn't I load? Let's say I use, again, think about a word processor. Okay? Any word processor, because they're all terrible. Right? How many, uh, like, they, they all have these huge code bases, right? Because they're really complex. 
how much of that code do you think you actually execute in a session using that application? I don't know. Make a guess. I think 10 is too high. I would go with 1, right? It's, it depends on what you're doing, right? Like, if you're bringing up OpenOffice to, like, do a flyer with your name on it and print it off for some reason, you know, I don't know, 0.1% of the code? These things have all these funky features, right, that nobody ever uses. They've all got 15 ways to do the same thing, right? And usually it's hard enough to figure out one, okay? So in general, th there's no reason to load all this code, right? Okay, same thing with the heap, right? The heap, I think, is a little bit of a different story, right? The process might say, I need four megabytes more heap. I know I do. I'm going to use all of it, right? And the kernel might say, right. Okay, again, I'll make, I'm going to grant your request. I'll make a note of it. I'll, make, I'll write it down here in my page table so you're allowed to use that memory. But I'm not going to back that with real memory until you really show me that you're serious about this code, right? Or you're serious about these data structures. You said you're going to take these data structures out every night, but I'm not going to let you, you know, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pencil it into my calendar. But when you show up at my door waiting, waiting for the memory, then, then I'll make sure it's there, right? And so the idea here is that until I either execute an instruction from a code page or do a load and store to a data page. Basically, until I use a piece of memory, a page in my virtual address space, the operating system is going to try to avoid backing that page with any real physical memory. Right? And the reasons for this are the ones that we just described. Right? A lot of code is never executed. Right? Never. In fact, in, in, com in companies like Microsoft and other big software projects, they run what are called dead code elimination tests. Right? Because it's possible that in something as complex as Firefox, there are code paths that it is impossible to execute, right? And, and you know, the compiler hasn't been able to figure this out because it's all really complicated, right? But when they run testing, right, at least like Microsoft, you know, when they run test suites, one of the things they look for is which code paths are being executed. And if there's a code path that is never executed, right, it means one of two things. Either the code path is completely unreachable, in which case I might as well get rid of it because it's just taking up space. Or worse, that code path is so weird right, that it's never tested by my test suite. Right? And what does this mean? What, what, who might try to get the system to go down this code path? An attacker. Right? A lot of times, dead code paths or very, very, very cold code paths that never get hit in test suites have all sorts of bugs in them right? because those bugs are never uncovered. And so if I'm a clever attacker and I find out pieces of Firefox that never get used, if I can figure out a way to get the code down that through some sort of very weird thing, right, very weird set of conditions, I may be able to find a buffer exploit or something else that I can use. Right? But in general, a lot of code is never used from the operating system. It doesn't care why the code is there, but it's going to say, until you execute it, I'm not going to put it there. Okay? So on Monday, we will talk about demand paging, uh, and we will talk about page replacement. All right? Have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday.